And welcome, welcome everybody out tonight to the evening worship service, uh, Springfield First Baptist Church. Do have a couple of additions to our prayer list. Uh, Brenda was telling me that Miss Wanda's not uh, feeling well. Let's continue to remember her. And also, uh, Co the Coy Middlebrooks family. Coy passed away uh, this weekend. Let's, let's remember his family. It's one of Mother's cousins, which I guess in turn makes it one of my cousins, and Amy's cousins, and Daddy's cousins by marriage. But uh, he lived there at uh, Powell, right in the middle of Powell, Alabama at uh, my Uncle Emmett's old store building there. And uh, he, he's been sick this past week and then passed away this weekend. Uh, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and then we'll get started tonight in First Samuel chapter 22. Uh, most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we thank you for your many, many blessings that you send our way for the, this opportunity, Lord, to, to meet tonight with your people. And Lord, uh, we just lift up Miss Wanda to you, Lord, that you'll uh, heal her body, Lord. Uh, she's having problems with her hip, as you know, Lord. And Lord, we we just ask you to heal her. And Lord, I ask you to be with Coy's family, Lord, and his passing. And Lord, you that you comfort his family. And uh, Lord, to be with these, Lord, we mentioned this morning for prayer. And uh, we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look tonight to, to 1 Samuel chapter number 22. And as we look there, we I think we got down through verse 5 last week. So we'll read in just a minute verse 6 through the remainder of the chapter. And uh, knowing this, that just keep in mind as we uh, going through David's life, he's coming uh, through a time he's done a bit anointed king and uh but king saul is still king at the moment and uh he, david's going through some hardships but we read last week where uh some of the hardships in his life some of the hardships in our life we bring upon ourselves and we're going to see uh the i guess for lack of a better word the ramifications of what he did last week we're going to see what happens this week but whatever circumstances that we go through let's remember this that all things work together for good to them that love the lord if we stumble and we fall are there still uh again ramifications for that yes but uh let's, let's read tonight First Samuel 22, verses 6 through 23. But in, in, in it all, God is still there with us, with his children. In verse 6, it says, When Saul heard that David was discovered and the men that were with him, uh, now Saul abode in Gabeah under a tree in Ramah, uh, having his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing about him. Then Saul said to his servants that stood about him, Here now, you Benjaminites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards, and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds, that all of you have, uh, that all of you have considered against me, and there is none that showeth me that my son hath made a league with the son of Jesse. And there is none of you that is sorry for me or showeth me uh, to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie and wait so as this day. Then answered Doeg the Edomite, which was set over the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub. And he inquired of the Lord for him and gave him victuals and gave, and gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. And the king sent to call Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all of uh, his father's house, the priests that were in Nob, and they came all of them to the king. And, set, and Saul said, Hear now, thou son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here, here am I, my lord. 
And he said unto them, Why have you conspired against me? Thou and, thy, and the son of Jesse, and that thou hast given him bread and the sword, and hast inquired of God for him, that he should rise against me to lie in wait as at this day. Then Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who is so faithful among all thy servants as David, which is the king's son-in-law, and goeth at, the, at thy bidding, and is honorable in thine house? Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Be it far from me, let not the king impute anything unto his servant, nor to all the house of my father. For thy servant knew nothing of all this, less or more. And the king said, Thou shalt surely die, Ahimelech, thou and all thy father's house. And the king said unto the footman that stood about him, Turn and slay the priest of the Lord, because their hand is with David, and because they knew when he fled, and did not show it to me. But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priest of the Lord. And the king said to Doeg, Turn thou and fall upon the priest. And Doeg the Edomite turned, and he fell upon the priest and slew on that day fourscore and five persons that did not wear a linen ephod. And Nob, the city of the priest, smote he with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and sucklings and oxen and asses and sheep with the edge of the sword. And one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abath, uh, Abathar, escaped and fled into, after David. And Abathar uh, showed David that Saul had slain the Lord's priest. And David said unto Abathar, I knew it that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of thy father's house. Abide thou with me, fear not. For he that seeketh my life seeketh thy life, but with me thou shalt be in safeguard. If you look back to, to verse number six, uh, so if you remember from last week, uh, there was a person, I don't know that it told last week who this person was, that was there out of Saul's household, and it turned out to be this Doeg, who was uh, the leader uh, of the servants of Saul, that was there and overheard all of what David said to the priest. And I want you to remember that what David said to the priest that day to get the bread from him, David just met, uh, made up. Uh, in other words, David lied to the priest to, to get the bread. And want to ask you a question. Uh, we've asked it before. When is lying okay? You say, well, David would have starved to death. Would he have? Would David have starved to death if he hadn't lied? Uh, won't you turn up with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 6. And let's start reading here in verse number 25 of, of Matthew chapter 6. Jesus, in the, what we call the Sermon on the Mount, uh, in the midst of it, says this in verse 25 of Matthew chapter 6. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. I think what David had gone through and what were those verses of Scripture that we read last week are like uh, many of us go through uh, from time to time, and we forget who has brought us all through this time. David forgot that the Lord had been with him all the way. But David took matters into his own hand. 
It's kind of like the story I share with you from time to time about the fellow that fell off in the river or the creek and uh, the water was swift and he was about to drown and he cried out to God, God, help me. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere appears this log and the guy grabs a hold of the log and tells God, never mind, I got this log down. We forget whom sends the help to us. Who sent the log to the feller in that story? God did. But a lot of times we look around at our circumstances and we say, well, if maybe if I do it, if I do this this way, it's going to be best. Well, I want to remind you that Jesus tells us in John 15, without me, you can do nothing. So what about what we got to eat? What about what we got to put on? He continues in verse 26 of Matthew 6. He says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather unto barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubic unto his stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, that they, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall ye not much more clothe, shall he not much more clothe you, O you, O ye of little faith? I want you to turn over with me to the book of uh, First Kings for just a minute. First Kings chapter number 17. This was in the life of Elijah that uh, he prayed that it not, might not rain and it didn't rain for three, three and a half years upon the earth. And we're going to take up in verse number two. This is after that prayer that he prayed. 1 Kings 17, verse 2 says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. Now, I want you to think for, with me for just a minute. No water. Some people think, well, that ain't a problem. No water, that ain't a problem. Well, uh, why don't you go home and cut your water off? See how long you can make it without it. There was no water in the land, and he tells him to go by the, dwell by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And look what he does for Elijah. It shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Now, uh, you say, well, that's, that's something. What you need to consider what it is he's saying there. The ravens who usually ate everything they got, they were going to be the ones to come feed Elijah by the brook. And there ain't no rain coming. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, bread and flesh in the evening. He drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. You say, well, see? Well, God has something else for him in store. He goes to this widow woman and she keeps on going back and back and back again to get meal out of that barrel. Kept making bread when she thought at the very beginning that there was only enough for her and her son to have one more meal. You see, God's going to supply the things that we stand in need of. He feeds the sparrows. He's going to take care of us. He clothes the leaders of the field. He's going to take care of us. And so 
did David have to lie to get that bread? I don't think he did. God would have provided some way, somehow for him. If you look back to 1 Samuel chapter number 22. So Saul has uh, found out where David is thanks to this feller by the name of Doeg. And uh, I want you to notice that even though he uh, tried to convince his servants there to go out and take care of business, that none of them seem to have flinched to go try to kill David. One, one writer says this, that he appealed to three things. And, you know, a lot, a lot of times preachers use words that all start with the same letter. And uh, this feller here did too. The elements are greed, glory, and guilt. He asked them a question. Will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? Is he going to be able to do that to you? So he appealed to their greed. Second thing he uh, did, their, did to their glory, he also indicated that he would give out promotions of all the captains of thousands and captains of hundreds. And then finally, he pleaded to their guilt in that he said, all of you have conspired against me None of you disclose to me that my son hath made a league with the son of Jesse. There is none of you who is sorry for me. And then look down in verse 9. Doeg said, oh, yeah, by the way, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob to Ahimelech, the son of Hahatub, and he told him the whole story. So he calls for the priest. What had the priest done that helped David? They had not only given him, bre given him bread, but they uh, had given him a, a Goliath's sword to protect himself with. Uh, the law says that there needed to be two or three witnesses. How many did Saul have here? He had one. So he go, not only does he go against everything that's right, but he also goes against the law in that he took one, one person's word for all these folks to get killed. You say, well, that's terrible. Well, what about us? Too many times. I hear of something being told about what somebody's done, and I think terrible of that person. But by the time it gets around to me, the story that I get ain't what really happened at all. Most of us have uh, played the game where, uh, like I started something, I started. I said something to Melanie. Melanie said it to Bridget, and then it came all the way back around to the Campbell family up here. And by the time it got to Melanie and went all the way around and got back to me, how many times do you think it would be the exact same thing I started out with? And you said, well, we're all church folks. We, we'll tell the truth. As my kids tell me from time, several times, Daddy, you, you add... A lot of stuff too, what really happened. So a lot of times we're in the church, we're guilty of condemning others without any witnesses at all. We'll get not only secondhand information, but 15th hand information. And woe to us that spread 15th hand information. Look down in verse 17. The king said unto the footman that stood about him, Turn and slay the priest. See, the priest had come, he had sent for the priest, and they came. I want to remind you about something. 
the tribe of Levi was the priestly tribe and uh, Saul being of the tribe of Benjamin, you say, well, how do you know that? Well, when Paul starts writing about himself in Philippians chapter 3, and he declares that he's of the tribe of Benjamin. So not only did he have the same name as the first king of Israel, but he also was of the same tribe as the king, the first king of, of, uh, ben, of uh, Israel. So the king turned to the footman that stood around him and said, Slay the priest of the Lord. I want to remind you, these are God's servants. God's servants. And he's just told his servants, kill them. Turn and slay the priest of the Lord, because their hand also is with David, because they knew when he fled and did not show it to me. But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the praise of the Lord. You and I, this one reminds you, you and I don't need a sword. You and I don't need a gun. We don't even need a pocket knife to kill somebody's reputation. And when you and I... Uh, Spread things. You say, I only talk about the truth. Well, why does it have to go any further? Let's go back to a verse of Scripture. We won't turn there, but let's go back to a verse of Scripture. We looked in Matthew chapter 6. We just, had, we just have to look at Matthew chapter 7, I believe it is, to find this. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. You say, well, Marty, you don't, you don't know how people have talked about me. So you're going to add to it. You're going to add to their wrong by adding your wrong to it. Just remember, two wrongs don't make a right. Verse 18. Then he turned said to Doag, Turn thou and fall upon the priest. And Doag the Edomite turned, and he fell upon the priest. Slew on that day 85 persons that did wear a linen ephod. 85 of God's servants. And like I said, we don't need, have to have a sword. We don't have to have even a toothpick to stab anybody with, to kill somebody's reputation. All it takes is just a few words. And I go back to what we've talked about in times past. It takes a lifetime for us to build up character to build up integrity. But it takes just a small amount of time for us to destroy something. One group of writers says this, lying and deception can cause devastating consequences. Lying and deception can there's a whole list of things. Arouse lust, greed, and covetousness. It can break hearts, cause financial difficulty, lead to false accusations, cause a person to leave, lose his job, keep, keep a person from securing employment or promotion, lead to unjust verdicts, lead to imprisonment, and even execution. David lived after telling the lie. But those that he told the lie to, it cost them their life. So we have 
When is it okay to lie? Next opportunity we have, and we've got to make a decision, are we going to lie or are we going to tell the truth? I want you to remember this story about David here. Is God, God uh, he has, uh, I believe, asked God's forgiveness of this. We talked about that last week. But there were still ramifications of what he did. So, back to our question, our age-old question. We that live under grace, can we do whatever we want to do? And that answer is no. We still need to lay down our life a living sacrifice to God, holy, acceptable unto Him. Abithar was the only priest that survived. And there in verse 23, David says, You abide thou with me. Fear not, for he that seeketh my life seeketh thy life, but with me you're going to be in safeguard. J. Vernon McGee says, about Saul. Now there's other writers that ask this question. Was he, did this evil spirit cause him to do this? Or was he just a just plain old mean that caused him to do this? Well, I think it's probably a combination of the two. J. Bird McGee says he was definitely Satan's man. And he says, you and I cannot be too sure about a person's salvation even when he is active in the Lord's service. When you see him motivated by a vicious bitterness of heart and soul, it is indeed difficult to call out the tires from the wheat at a time like that. Such was the case here. But you think about what led us up to this point. Was David responsible for these people's lives? No, I think Saul was the one that took them. But what if David had told them the truth? Would their life have been spared? Well, we'll never know. Because David took matters in his own hands. I asked you tonight, remember those we've mentioned for prayer? And, and do this for me. I'll try to do my best to do it as well. When we tell somebody that we're praying for them, pray for them. Don't let that just be words. When we tell somebody that we love them, love them. Don't let that just be words. And when we have the opportunity when God provi provides us the opportunity to speak up on his behalf, don't you let yourself talk yourself out of it. Don't say something like, I'll do it next time. God's provided us that time to do his work. Choose to follow him. Don't take matters into your own hands. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, tonight for your many blessings. Thank you for allowing us to be gathered as we are tonight. Thank you for these, Lord, that have joined us over the Internet tonight. And, Lord, uh, you have your own way in each one of our lives. Help us to remember that if we're saved, Lord, we are your servants. We are your ambassadors. We are your representatives wherever we go. As far as one another is concerned, Lord, help us to exhort and build up one another. And Lord, help us go out to a lost and dying world and share your gospel. Lord, we'll give you, be careful to give you all the honor and praise for it all. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we...
have a song of invitation tonight and we'll tell uh, our friends on Facebook to have a good week and we'll be back Wednesday night at 7 o'clock and we hope you'll join us there then. Have a great week.